Amen. Well, the title of my message is Stewarding the Outpour. Um, it wasn't raining earlier, but when I came out of North Campus on the way here, it was raining pretty good. So I'm like, Lord, was that a confirmation that this was like the word today? I didn't look at the weather, so I didn't know that was coming. But stewarding the outpour is the title of my message today. And I want to actually start off with sharing a vision that the Lord gave me about 10 years ago. Um, and I believe we're living in that right now. And it's pertinent now, so I wanted to share it today. Um, but in the vision, um, I was praying when I received this vision, and I saw the picture of the United States, and each state kind of had its borders, uh, the territories kind of mapped out like a traditional map. And each state was on a track, its own track, and it had the ability to shift upward or downward, depending on what it decided to do. And in the vision, the Lord was pouring out his Holy Spirit in the form of like a tsunami, tidal wave, crazy wave coming from the West Coast of the United States, um, namely California is what I saw. And this water was washing over the entire United States as it went eastward. And I started hearing these phrases, like offensive type of phrases Things like, what good could come from California? I don't want to receive that because I don't trust it. Uh, nothing, nothing from California can benefit me. I started hearing these types of phrases. And the states that were speaking that way, they stayed high up on their track, on their, on their, um, in their position. And there were other states that went super low on their track, as low as they could go. And as the water washed over the United States, representing revival or the Holy Spirit, these states were able to actually contain and carry the move of God and the Holy Spirit because they decided to go really low and they caught the water. And so this vision, the main theme that I took from this vision wasn't necessarily where the revival was going to come from, what it was going to look like. The theme that I took from this was that revival is sustained when we go low. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today, is how do we steward the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that he's doing here at our church and in our region and in our sphere of influence? Because how many of you know that Harvest Church is in revival? Come on, do you know that? Did you know it's not common to have this kind of experience every week? This is a revival service in many, uh, an out-of-the-box revival service in many areas of our country and in the world. This is like what people flock to from all over the world, which we actually see here. Um, but this is our norm. This is our Sunday morning. We are in revival, praise the Lord, and we have been in revival. We have been in revival. Last year, 2022, our church baptized 147 people. That's a lot of people, 147. That's a person being baptized every 2.4 days. Is that cool or what? And I believe that we're, our trajectory, we're already on track to like way out, outdo that for 2023. So many people got saved. So much money was, was raised and given away. You know that's revival when people are giving very generously outside of themselves. So we are in revival. And I believe that the water level of, of Harvest Church and what we are carrying is actually increasing. And our capacity to carry revival is actually increasing. We are, we are growing in our personal capacity and in our capacity as a church. You even see that physically with locations and buildings opening up. We, our capacity is increasing. We're going from glory to glory. But the Bible says that God sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. And so what I want to share today is that, first point in your notes, is that experiencing temporary revival is not an indicator of God's favor but sustaining revival is. So if God pours out his rain or his spirit on the righteous and the unrighteous, there's no difference between the righteous or the unrighteous. But what makes a person favored of the Lord is where he decides to stay and where we can be hosts of his presence. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. You know, our prayer has to shift from just Holy Spirit come to Holy Spirit stay here Holy Spirit, dwell here, live here, embody our, our life here. Our, our prayer has to shift from that. You know, we have become really good at inviting the Holy Spirit, 
You know, a lot of places, um, it takes like, you know, three songs for you to feel the presence of God. You know, here, you, you, they start out the worship and it's like the first guitar strum and you're like, you're in. Like, we've become really, really accustomed to inviting the Holy Spirit and, and you know, knowing how to do that. But, you know, there are things that sustain the Holy Spirit that I believe we need to focus on if we're going to be a generational place of revival where our children and our children's children get to experience what we're experiencing here today. You know, I love the history of revival. Anybody else just really enjoy uh, looking into the history of revival, modern day history? Um, and one of the things that is so sad to me is that you read about these moves of God, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s, and you look at these places now, these locations, some of the churches, some of the locations where these things happen, and they're like monuments. They're like, they're graveyards of what God did in the past. And I refuse to be a person, I refuse to be a church that becomes a monument of what God did. And so it's important for us in, in the long game to be people who know how to not just invite the Holy Spirit, but sustain the Holy Spirit for generations and generations to come. For the sake of our children and our children's children. How many of you had to fight to be where you are today in God? I'm sure every single person. Did you know that when you live a legacy and a godly life, your children get to start off way farther than you and they get to actually, you know, start where your ceiling left off. And that's my prayer in the season is God, teach me how to sustain the move of God and what you're doing so that in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, they'll look back at this church as a sign and a wonder of what it looks like to sustain a historic revival and not just get poured out on for 20 years and then the Lord lift off of us. That's my heart. My heart is that the nations of the world would be influenced by the food in this house and they would actually look to this house to know how to walk in revival Revival, how to pastor revival, how to have good leadership in revival. Amen? Are you with me? Okay. All right. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You know, I, I used to read this passage and automatically think about money, which is important. Money opens a lot of doors for your children if they have it. They could open businesses. They could buy houses. They could do a lot uh, with money. But this is a spiritual inheritance as well. What am I leaving my children in God that's gonna actually sustain them and open doors for them for the rest of their lives? The godly leave an inheritance for their children's children. So again, we want our church to feed and resource the nations. The mission of our church, reaching cities and influencing nations. What does that look like? That looks like us giving away what we have. And what we have, if we can steward it, we can become masters of it. Not that we master God or we, we uh, tell God what to do, but good stewardship can be imparted to other people and that's what we're sending to the nations, amen? So how do we steward the outpour? Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So there are things that the Holy Spirit is drawn to, and there are things that the Holy Spirit is repelled by. We know that, right? When we start getting angry and we start, get, start cussing or Christian cussing, you know? Y'all know about the Christian cussing or the head cussing? We start getting like that. Do you feel the Holy Spirit? No, you're feeling another spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. When we start getting fearful about making ends meet or what this person's gonna do or that person's gonna do, do you feel the Holy Spirit? No. When you start accusing people or, or getting offended with people, I don't feel the Holy Spirit when I do those things. But there are things that draw the Holy Spirit and keep the Holy Spirit present with us. And so when our cities, our churches, our homes become places that welcome the Holy Spirit, he will be Lord and leader in those places. And that's the goal. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit is symbolized in the Bible is as a dove. So remember when Jesus was baptized um, in the book of Luke, it says that when he went into the water, he came out and the Spirit of God descended on him like in the form of a dove. 
voice of heaven, you know, heaven open, the voice of heaven, the Lord says, God says, this is my son, who I'm well pleased. It was a dove. And I love that, that symbolism because when you think of a dove, a dove is, can be very um, temperamental. So if you have a dove on your shoulder and you decide to start doing like a mosh pit dance or something, like that thing's gone, right? If you decide to jump, that thing is gone. They're very temperamental. And it's a great reminder to us to be mindful constantly of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When I was in ministry school, some of our leaders, they were tasked with this assignment to carry around this like hollowed out egg. So it's basically like an empty egg with just the shell. And they had to keep it like on their person for seven days, 24 seven. So they had to take a shower, they had to go to sleep, everything. They had to have this egg with them. And some of them, of course, broke it like first hour, uh, you know, by accident or whatever. But the point, the objective of this assignment was to be mindful of the Holy Spirit and to not grieve the Holy Spirit. So things that grieve the Holy Spirit are our words, how we treat and relate to other people. And really what it comes down to is things that come from our heart, things that are sourced from our heart. So number one, the first point on your notes Stewarding the outpour requires that we tend to our heart by keeping it pure and humble. James 4, 6 says, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves therefore before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. He gives grace to the humble. You know, so revival is is such a an external thing that we see, right? So when we think of revival, we think of God pouring out his spirit and whole cities getting saved. We think about, you know, the stories of where bars were closing down and, and, and whole industries and cities are closing down because the spirit of God comes into a city. People's bodies getting healed, people being, um, you know, just set free from different things. We see a lot of externals with revival. Um, an example of that is when I was in, Ministry school, we were uh, ministering on a college campus in Stockton, and we were in the big quad area, and our group had like a microphone and a big PA system, and there were some other groups that also had their um, agenda, and they were doing their thing as well. And uh, I remember one of the leaders, he got up on the microphone, and he says, the Lord told me that to tell you that it's gonna rain at this certain time today, And it's a sign that he is real and that he wants you to turn to him. And so we looked at the forecast, not a chance of rain. It didn't rain that week. It was not a rainy uh, forecast in any way. And so, of course, after he says that public, bold declaration, he goes and, like, prays the heck out of that word because he's like, oh, Lord, help me because I'm going to get kicked off campus if this doesn't come come to pass, you know. But wouldn't you know it, by the time that he said It was pouring rain on campus. And I remember looking out at this quad area and I felt like I was in a dream, like a daze, because there were college students on their knees, crying out to God, praying, weeping, repenting, because the Lord showed up in this miraculous way, very openly seen external uh, manifestation of revival. But at the end of the day, with all of that, Revival is very much internal rather than external. God's goal with revival isn't to just do the big stuff and the big displays. The goal of revival is our heart, is our heart's full surrender. You know, when I think about these open displays of God's power, I think about Elijah in the Bible. One of my favorite stories is the showdown with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So the nation of Israel at this time, they were sort of in this indecisive place. Like, do we want to worship Baal, which is a false god? Or do we want to worship God, most high, Yahweh? Do we want to really worship our God? And uh, so they had the showdown. And the prophet Elijah was like, all right, well, whoever's God answers by fire, let him be worshiped. Let, let him be God. And so the prophets of Baal, there's 450 of them. They're like cutting themselves and they're like crying out, please answer us. They're, and Elijah's just talking smack the whole time. And I just love this guy. I'm like, can I just high five you for that? 
And he's just saying, hey, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe you gotta say it louder. He can't hear you. He's just taunting them. And then he walks up, you know, and he pours the water on his. He's like, oh, you, you wanna see some fire? Let's just pour some more water. And of course, um, the Lord answers by fire immediately. The stones are even like burnt up, like which is crazy. But one thing that really stood out to me is before the Lord answered by fire, Elijah prayed, and this was his prayer. He says, answer me so that these people will know you, O Lord, that you are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. The point of the fire, the point of the open display wasn't the power. It was that people would turn to God from their heart. So again, revival looks very external, but it's an internal work of the Holy Spirit. So we've got to keep an attitude um, of humility and purity when it comes to our heart. Heidi Baker says, the secret place is the secret to revival. And I just love that. So simple, right? We can look at all the, the programs. We could study past revivals. We could do all the stuff. But what it comes down to is your relationship with God, my relationship with God, and if we're being sincere in it or not. You know, I don't know about you, but when I am struggling with something, maybe internally or, um, you know, I'm, I'm insecure, I'm, I'm fearful, I'm, I'm having a hard time, my first instinct from my flesh is to just get really busy and to get really productive because I feel good about myself. Like, let me find something I'm really good at so I can forget that I, I feel horrible in this other area, right? But the Lord is requiring us to look at those things and actually give them to him, and to do the heart work. You know, I, I prayed about how to, how to word that because at first I wrote, we've got to do the hard work, but I wrote, we've got to do the heart work because they're, they're the same thing. The heart work is the hard work and that's what God is calling us to do if we're gonna sustain revival and actually live present in this walk with him and not checked out just doing the stuff, right? It comes from our heart. A couple weeks ago, I was here at this campus. I was worshiping in the front. Um, we have these crosses here. And I noticed something on the cross. And just looking at it, um, I just began to weep. Because in one moment, with one quick snapshot of a picture, the Lord showed me an area of my life that I had put in a box, an actual box at my house uh, and in my heart, uh, something I had put in a box, a painful um, experience that my husband and I had, probably one of the most painful experiences of our life. I put this thing that represented that in this box and I put it away for safekeeping because I might need to go back to that someday or I just, I just needed to put it away. And the Lord showed me that when we surrender those things to him, the hard stuff, the vulnerable stuff, that's when he actually could move in our lives. Within two weeks of me doing that, I felt like the Lord unlocked a purpose in me and what he's called me to do with my personal life. Things that I've been praying into for like 10 years, things that I'm like, Lord, give me clarity on this. I need your wisdom, I need your clarity. I've been asking for this for 10 years. And in one moment, the Lord revealed something to surrender. And because I was quick to do it, revelation came to my life and something just clicked. And so a lot of times we don't know that we need an encounter with God until we have an encounter with God. We're going throughout our life just being faithful, doing what we know to do. Praise the Lord for faithful people. But in one moment, God can reveal something to you and it's our job to not tell him why we shouldn't do that, but to just obey him and just surrender that thing to him. And he's gonna reveal some things to you this morning, I believe, that you are to surrender to him. And we're gonna take some time at the altar um, as we end service today to just surrender some stuff to him. Doesn't need to look a certain way. It just looks like coming up and saying, Lord, I surrender that thing to you. You know what to do with it more than I know what to do with it. And I trust you with it. Amen? And being truthful about it. Number two, Stewarding the outpour requires that we keep an attitude of childlike awe and wonder. Matthew 18, two through four says, then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I love that picture because 
I don't know about you, but half the time I feel in over my head. How many of you guys have, have felt that way before? You're like, I'm doing these things that, that I think are great and awesome, but I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm, I'm right there. Uh, you're in good company if you've felt that way before. So this scripture gives me a lot of hope because it says, if you come like a child, you got it. I'm like, okay, great, I could do that. I could, I could, I could act like I don't know what I'm doing. And yeah, I love reading about revival history, as I mentioned, because when you study the moves of God, so many of these um, outpourings of the Holy Spirit began with people who had childlike faith, who had humble beginnings, who didn't have the education, who didn't have the connections or the notoriety. These were people who simply wanted to obey God. And that gives me a lot of hope for what he could do with my life if I'm just humble and I have a childlike attitude. I wanna share two stories with you, um, two not God stories. Um, but I'm gonna start off with kind of prefacing um, just sort of the, the season we were in as a church when these things happened. So our church was, this is probably about eight or nine years ago, and we were seeing like a great increase of like physical manifestations of glitter, gold dust, jewels, uh, feathers. Like we were seeing all kinds of that type of stuff. Um, if you've ever experienced that before, sometimes when the glory of the Lord comes into a room, you'll see like, you'll, you'll look at your hands and you're like covered in gold glitter in your hands. And you're like, wow, I think the Lord is, is doing something. Like that type of sign and wonder was, was very common at that time. We still see that, but it was like when it first broke out. So anyways, um, I remember one time I was here at the altar worshiping and I looked on the plat or I looked at this, the steps here and I saw this big old huge gem on the steps. I was like, oh my gosh, like the Lord loves me so much. He just dropped this gem in worship and like, I gotta go grab it. So I'm just like going between people. I, I grab the gem, stick it in my pocket. And of course, you know, when something like that happens, you jump on Facebook and take a picture of it. Like, look what the Lord did. I, saw, I found this gem, the Lord's showing up and just testifying, right? So then uh, somebody comments on there, which they didn't private message me, which I had to get over. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they comment and they say, oh yeah, about that. They're like, um, I was on the worship team and I lost the gem in my shoe. And so that's actually my gem. Thank you so much for finding it. And I'm like, what? So I, I was like, okay, whatever. It was funny, right? So you just, all you could do is laugh. Uh, the next story, not God's story, was I was working at our office across the street, our ministry office, and I used to have a cubicle right in the center of the office, and I remember I was working, and all of a sudden, I smelled this scent of, like, cologne. And I'm like, that's weird. Like, nobody was in the office. There was, like, only three or four of us working that day. So I was like trying to investigate. I'm like walking around. I'm like, who, where did that come from? So I called the front office on the phone and I said, hey, did somebody just come in that I didn't notice? They're like, no, nobody's come in like a couple hours. Like it's just, just been us. I said, oh my gosh, I think the Lord showed up and I've got the fragrance of the Lord in my cubicle. And I was like, come over, like go sniff my cubicle. Like, like the Lord showed up. He's telling me that he's near to me. And they're like, oh my gosh. So we're like praising Jesus. Like, wow, this is so cool. So then one of our pastors comes out of his office and he's like, what's going on? And I said, go smell my cubicle. I said, the Lord is moving and like the fragrance of the Lord is here. He's like, oh, he's like, you see that vent over your, your cubicle? He's like, so that's the output air. He's like, the input is in my office and I just sprayed some cologne on myself. I was like, really? So moral of the story, I share those not God stories so that you can laugh with me so I feel better about myself for one. Uh, but also to say, I would rather 10 times out of 10 be looking for God, thinking it's God and it not be God, than to always think something isn't God. Oh, that couldn't be God. Oh, that certainly isn't God. Amen, right? You know, the story I think of with this in the Bible is I think of um, Elijah again when he, when he calls for the rains to come back after a famine. He tells his servant, go look out and see if you see any signs of rain coming, any, any clouds. And the servant goes out and he's like, didn't see anything for quite some time. And then finally he comes back on the seventh time. 
He says, well, I see that a cloud, like the size of a man's hand, I think that was childlike faith. Because the mature, smart person would say, well, certainly no rain could come from that little cloud. That's, that, that's just a little passing by cloud. That's, that's nothing. But he saw something in the form of, of, you know, this tiny little cloud that the Lord was able to use because they put their faith on it. And so I would, again, nine times, no, 10 times out of 10, prefer to be the person that looks like a dork on social media, posting about a gem that came from someone's shoe, than to be the person who is stuck on saying why things aren't God. So if we wanna receive what God is doing in this new season, we have to be childlike in our approach to God. You know, I mentioned this earlier, but if somebody who just got saved three months ago, you know, total heathen before they gave their life to Jesus, got saved and the Lord decided to pour out his spirit on that person and use them mightily and use, you know, the next revival come through that person. But I've been saved for a long time. I've done Bible college. I've been in ministry. I've prayed for people. I've traveled. I've done all these things and he's not moving through me. Can I still receive from them? Yes. I pray to God it's a yes. But that's what we have to keep in mind is that what the Lord is doing sometimes isn't going to look the way it's always looked before but it takes a childlike faith to know the difference. Amen? Number three, we have to discern the spirit of God and not get hung up on the package it comes in. You know, again, kind of going back to that vision I shared earlier, can anything good come, up, come from California? Do we have those biases in our spirit about what God could do and what God can't do? Of course, we stay within the confounds of the Bible. You know, we don't, we don't deviate from that. But just because a move of God doesn't look like the way it looked when I was in my heyday doesn't mean it's not a move of God. Just because it doesn't have the, the flair or the personality of when I was in the move of God doesn't mean it's not a move of God. I have to discern the spirit of God and not get offended by the package that it comes to. We have to be stewards of revival and that requires us to recognize the ebb and flow of the Holy Spirit, to get really good at discerning the spirit of God. Have you guys ever been in worship before and you know, maybe here at the church and the keyboard player or the guitar player, they start playing something and you're like, whoa, that's anointed. The Lord is on that. And you don't know why? That's discerning the spirit of God. In the book of Luke 5.17, it says, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord is present to do certain things at certain times. If that wasn't true, this passage would just say, and the power of the Lord was present. But no, it was present to heal them. So we have to not only discern when the Spirit of God is here and when it's not here, we have to discern what he's here for and become stewards and studiers of the presence of God so that we can discern more clearly what he's doing. For instance, the Lord may show up in a room and he's here for salvation, like for people to come to him and get saved and give their lives to him. Somebody might come up and give an altar call and it's like the most simple altar call you've ever heard. It's like, come to the front if you wanna give your life to the Lord. And like the whole place comes and like kneels on their face. And you're like logically like, what? But then somebody else is like working this altar call for 30 minutes and like one person comes up and it's like grandma who's afraid to offend the preacher so she comes up just to pacify them, you know? It's like that's the difference between the presence of the Lord being present to save or do this thing or that thing. The presence of the Lord might be present for addictions to be broken off. The presence of the Lord might be present for, um, you know, Families to be reconciled, marriages to be reconciled. We have to become diligent in discerning the spirit of God and become carriers of what he wants to do if we're gonna sustain revival. We gotta look for him with our spirit. Search for him with your spirit. Psalm 42, verse one says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God, and thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go? and stand before him. We've gotta have that picture of spiritual hunger that we see in this passage, of searching for the Lord with our spirit. When I'm walking through the store, I wanna be the person that's searching for the spirit of the Lord. What are you doing? Who are you highlighting to me, God? What do you want me to say to that cashier? What do you want me to say to that young mother I see struggling walking down the aisle of the grocery store? Like, like search for the Lord with your heart, 
and you will be a steward and a carrier of revival. We don't wanna put him in a box. We don't want to suppress him. We don't wanna get caught up on what the person next to us is doing. When the power of the Lord is present for a specific thing, you might feel the need to cry. How many of you guys have felt that before? You're in service and you're like, I don't know why, I just like, I feel like I need to cry. I, I'm not upset, I just, I just wanna cry. You know what you do in those moments? You cry, you let it out. But the person next to me is laughing and, and jumping. That's okay. The Lord's maybe telling them to do that. Or, you know, maybe the Lord's calling you to be the laugher and jumper. But the person next to me is on their face crying. Should I get down and like start crying? Fake cry? No, just laugh and jump. Because that's what the Lord is, is doing and we wanna be sensitive and authentic and worship him in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit and in truth means you're, you're truthful. You're doing what he's telling you to do and not what he's not telling you to do. Number four, get as low as you can and live there. Get as low as you can and live there. There are levels of going low. Going low meaning being humble before God. You know, I don't have the right to say, God, I went low four times this week. So that person, it's their turn. No, 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 no. We don't have the right to do that. I don't have the right to even say, Lord, I've been going low for 10 years. I'm done. <laughs> now it's their turn to go low. No. Go low and live there. There are levels of going low. I think about King David. King David was a person who was so humble. If you look at his example with how he related to Saul when Saul was persecuting him, hunting him, chasing him. He went low, he stayed low, even after Saul was dead. Concerning Saul, he was low. He was humble before the Lord and the Lord gave him a lasting dynasty. The Lord caused the Messiah to be birthed through his lineage. And I believe it's because he had a heart for God. He obeyed God. He was a worshiper of God. Amen? So the lower you go, the more deeply you get to experience God. You know, I just picture again that vision I had where the, the lower I go, the more water I hold. I get to experience God, but the lower I stay or the lower I live, the more of the presence of God I get to have. It becomes my inheritance. It becomes what I, what I operate out of. It's not just something that's gonna pass me by. I have to live in that low place. And for the sake of my own reputation, I don't really care. I don't really care, right? If that means experiencing more of God, I don't really care about my dreams. I don't really care if my, my name is known. I don't really, for the sake of experiencing God, for the sake of my children experiencing God in a place like this, for the sake of being a sustainer, I will not be a person that people look back on and say, because of your passivity, the revival stopped. Because of your ability to, to, you know, your inability to stay present with God with your heart and go low, the revival stopped. I won't be that person. I'll be the person that's on my face going as low as I can before the Lord because I want more of him and for the sake of my children's children. I could fight for myself, but I will fight for my children. I will. <laughs> Come on. I will. And so we have to get serious about this. And our lives will not lift in God. Some of us have dreams, aspirations. They're from the Lord. But those things won't come to pass until you learn how to serve. They won't come to pass until you learn how to have someone else's visions come to pass because you've assisted them and you've, you've served with them. And it's up to the Lord on when that season breaks and that season changes and you get to be the one that, you know, is pursuing your dream. That's the Lord's doing. He's up to that. And so I get to choose today to go low and commit myself to that. Sometimes we can humble ourselves and sometimes we can just get really humbled by life's experiences, life circumstances. How many of you all have been there before? I got humbled by life circumstances. But either way, it's a good place to be because it says if you're humble in due time, God will exalt you but you humble yourself before him. And that comes down to our surrender, our ability to be present with him and to not ignore the things that are going on inside, 
for the sake of appearances or for the sake of what it looks like. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite you to, to stand up. I want to pray for you. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we don't know we need a touch from God until we get a touch from God. I could be walking around in a, in a daze for a year, think I've got it going on, and then the Lord encounters me, and he removes something from my eyes, and all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, I was lost. I was off base. I needed a touch from the Lord, and I didn't know it. And so how we get to that place is, again, we just, we remain humble before him. We tell him, I need you. I can't do this without you. I have nothing without you. I'm gonna invite a prayer team to come onto the front. You know, something I mentioned earlier was, you know, there are people here that I believe you have gone through some stuff in your past. You've gone through hurt, disappointment, trauma. You might be on the other side of it now, praise the Lord. But that thing, you've put it in a box for safekeeping. And the Lord wants to heal that place in your heart because he has more for you. He has, he has so many wonderful things for you. But the longer you hold on to that pain and you keep it for yourself, the longer you will stay in that season of not knowing what to do next. I feel like the Lord is gonna release and activate people in their calling when they surrender what they've put in that box. So if that's you this morning, I'm just gonna pray over you. And I wanna encourage you to come to this altar to receive prayer. If you don't want to receive prayer, so to speak, just come to the altar and, and kneel and, and just give that thing to God. But our prayer team is here if you'd like some um, support with that, but let's just pray. Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you that you have called them as a carrier of your glory, a carrier of your Holy Spirit, and I pray right now, God, that that thing in their heart that they have locked away in a box, Lord, that you would bring it to their mind right now. That relationship that failed, that disappointment, the thing they thought was gonna work out a certain way and it didn't. The way they were slighted, the way they were rejected. Lord, the pain they experienced, God, you know it. And I pray right now, Father, that there would be a, a spirit of surrender here today, that there would be a grace for people to hand those keys to you today. And Lord, I thank you for healing the brokenhearted. I thank you that one of the things that you are drawn to is a contrite heart, a broken heart, a heart that is in need of you. You will not reject that, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that you would move mightily in every person's heart and mind. We pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified in this place. We pray, God, that you would put us on a mission to steward and sustain the outpour of your Holy Spirit in our generation and for the generation to come, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.